Yesterday, um, we looked at two mm, sort of non-vector applications of surface integral, that is area and mass. But we're going to bring vectors in today, looking at flux, because flux is all about measuring flow, or at least measuring um, how much of something is flowing. And so there are vector quantities involved because there's direction of flow involved. Let me just find my notes here. Okay, flux. Okay, flux is very important. It's highly likely. Let me have a look at the calendar. How does class test 2 align with divergence theorem? Okay, divergence theorem will not be included in class test 2 because we'll basically be busy doing divergence theorem at the same time as class test 2. Divergence theorem involves flux. If you see a flux question in the exam, it is quite plausibly a divergence theorem problem. However, that won't be the case in class test 2. Class test 2 has not yet been set, and I am not going to set it. But simply from experience, I can pretty much guarantee there'll be a flux question in class test 2. I repeat, it hasn't been set, and I don't set it. But I'm just speaking from experience. It's, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if there's two surface integral questions in class test 2, one on flux and one on maybe mass. I don't know. There, there's an awful lot of stuff to fit into class test 2, though, so maybe not. But flux, very, very likely. So here we go. If. If. So now what we've got is what we, what we call here is a vector field. Okay, this is a vector field. You're putting in a vector, you're getting out a vector. Oops. Okay, so we're putting in the vector x, y, z, in other words, a position in space, and we're getting out something that's a vector quantity that has as its component functions p, q, and r. If f is the velocity field, of a fluid, then the volume of fluid, catch up with me stylus, catch up with me stylus, then the, I wrote the, hello, then the, <laughs> volume of fluid, flowing in unit time, through a small surface element, good old small surface element, hello integration, with area delta S, is approximately F dot N delta S. Okay. Sure. I've actually dropped this lectern too low. Goodness me, there actually is a too low for Tracy. I've never had to raise a lectern before. Um, okay, now, oh, this, I need to finish the sentence. Where n is a unit vector which is normal to the surface. All right, now before, I, before I, I'm going to justify that for you, but before I do, let me finish with what we do when we integrate. So the flux of F, oops, that's an F, doesn't look like an F, does it? Let me fix that. Of F through a surface S is basically summing all of those, is the total volume of fluid with velocity field f. We sometimes use v for velocity instead of f, velocity field f, which passes through s in unit time.
Hence, and here we come into the summing up part, the flux of F through S is the surface integral, 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 S Did I put that in the handbook in a box? I don't think I did. No, I didn't. Okay. Oh, and just to sort of... Uh, so what we're doing here is basically your basic standard flux calculation. And again, if you look at your decision trees on page 11, you will see that present in the decision tree. Um, yeah, you'll see other options as well, but we've only just started on flux, so this is just the one option. Okay, all right. Now, I'm going to justify that f dot n delta s. Basically, what we're interested in, if you imagine a little piece of your surface, a little piece of your surface, so here my hand is representing piece of surface. If my, if my fluid is flo flowing completely orthogonal to my surface, then I think of all of that in unit time, in unit time, I'm interested in the amount of flow through my surface. So in fact, orthogonal is actually the least interesting example. Parallel is the most interesting example. If I have a little piece of surface and my, my fluid is flowing, but it's flowing parallel to my surface element, then none of it is flowing through. So even though the, the fluid may be flowing quite fast, there's zero flux through my surface. And of course, the exact opposite of that is if the fluid is flowing orthogonal to my surface, in which case all of it's flowing through. And in between, you can basically, if it's flowing obliquely to my surface element, you can kind of divide it into components. You can divide it into a parallel and perpendicular component, and it's only the perpendicular component that we're interested in. And that's sort of how we divide up how much of the fluid is flowing through the surface. And that sort of dividing up gives you a little cos expression, which we can then interpret as a dot product. So, <coughs> if we have a little piece of surface, and my fluid is flowing like that, then there's zero flow. This is delta S through delta S. Okay, and if I have a little surface element and if it's flowing that way, then you can think of uh, all the fluid flows through, all fluid flows through delta S. And if we have something that's in between, then actually we're interested in this part. Only some fluid flows through <laughs> delta S per unit time. We, we're interested in the orthogonal component. We're interested in the components of the fluid that the, the, of the fluid flow that is orthogonal to our surface element. And the way we get that is with a little cos calculation, where that theta is the angle between our vector and the vector that we're really interested in, which is the dotted one. Okay, in other words, it's orthogonal to the normal to my surface element. Okay, so... So that's what we're really interested in, because that's the sort of general case. That bottom one is the general case. The top one is the special case when theta equals pi over 2. And the middle one is the special case where theta equals 0. But our general case is that one at the bottom there. So that's the one that we develop our expression for. Our flux is the amount of flux in direction, I shouldn't say. Yeah, no, that's fine. Let me leave it at that. Direction of n. times the area 
which is f cos theta delta s I, to I told you the other day that I was writing a paper on vector notation. It's actually a follow-up of a previous one. I've done a whole bunch of things on vectors. Um, 2015 paper on dot products and dot products and how people don't understand the geometric interpretation of the dot product. If I asked you now to write down the geometric interpretation of the dot product. If you do a dot product, what's it actually telling you? Would you be able to do that? Because what it's doing is this. When you dot two vectors, if you dot one vector against another, you're basically working out how much of one vector is in the direction of the other vector. It's, it's, that's the sort of, I mean, that's very hand wavy. That's very vague words that I'm using there. But it's basically how much of one vector is in the direction of the other vector, which is exactly what we're working out here. We want to know how much of f is in the direction of n. Question. <laughs> yeah, they were all Fs. All Fs. There's, there's one P in the entire thing, and that is the P that is there. The first component of F. All the others are actually Fs. I just have terrible handwriting. Let's have a look. That one arguably looks like an F. That one arguably does not look like an F. Let me fix that one. There we go. And I'd say those... No, that one also doesn't really look much like an F. There we go. Uh, that one looks a bit like an F. Ah, that one looks like an F. Okay, <laughs> okay all right. Um, okay, so, so just to kind of go back, this one over here would be theta equals pi over 2 and cos of pi over 2 is 0. And this one over here, theta is equal to 0 and cos of 0 is 1. So in the first case, we have none of f is in the direction of n. In the other, we have all of f is in the direction of n. And for this general case, we have some of f is in the direction of n. And that's the f we want. We want the amount of fluid that is flowing directly through our surface element. Okay? So, um, in general, we write flux equals, well, flux through a particular surface element. So perhaps I should, in fact, say delta flux. But I'll just say flux uh, small bit of flux equals f dot n delta s. And then you'll notice when I wrote that integral, see how I wrote it. Ah, no, not ready for page jump. Come back. The sum of all such little bits of flux is double integral over the surface of f dot n ds. And then, that I s did you notice I also wrote that? OK, so let me explain what's going on there. Up until now, when we've had a little surface element, we've said, okay, we've got the surface, we're calling it S, we've got a little piece of surface, we're calling it delta S, delta S has area. Delta S no longer in flux just has area, delta S in fact also has orientation. There is an out, there's an outside and there's an inside, because we want to know how much of the fluid is flowing in a particular direction. So we want to know how much is flowing through our surface. Um, if we have a surface that's open, like a plane or a hemisphere or a paraboloid, our default orientation is upward. If we have a surface that is closed, like a sphere or an ellipsoid, our default orientation is outward. So those are the default orientations. If an orientation isn't given to you, that's what you'll assume. But sometimes an orientation is given, and then you have to use that orientation. But basically, your surface is oriented Delta S you can now think of not only as having area, but having a sense of direction to it. And hence, we can take 
the N, which, give, which is all about the orientation of our surface, and the delta S, which is all about the area of our surface, and combine them together into a single symbol. Question over there. No, the orientation doesn't mean the angle of the surface. It means that uh, it's the surf it's the side the side of the surface that we're considering the outside. So so if you have a paraboloid, the orientation would be would be upward, so therefore into the inside of the paraboloid. Downward would be outside of it. Question. Y it w well, it won't affect the magnitude, it'll just affect the sign. So, for instance, if, if you and I do the same flux calculation and I use an um, upward orientation for my paraboloid and you use downward orientation, we'll get the same number, but one of us will have a plus and one of us will have a minus. And minus means that your net flow is actually out, and plus will mean your net flow is in. So if you have a paraboloid, let's, let's say you have a plane, and you work out the flux through the plane, and the upward surface of your plane is what you cons is, is the orientation. You're considering that the normal of your plane points that way. And you work out that your flux is positive 10. It means that you have 10 units of your fluid flowing in the direction of your normal per unit time. Whereas if it was minus 10, it would mean that your normal is pointing this way, but your, flow is your net flow is actually that way. So you can, you can think of it as... And, and outside of your surface and an inside of your surface. Even for something like a plane, which you wouldn't think of as having inside and outside. Like one side, like one side has, been, has been painted and polished and made to look nice, and the other side is the inside and you're ignoring it. Yes? Uh, am I right in thinking that the, the geometric interpretation of the dark product is that you project your one vector yeah. onto the other? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're projecting one vector onto the other, and hence you're measuring how much of that vector is now in the direction of the other. Yeah. You can go read my paper if you want. It's online, all over the place. Um, what are we doing? Are we doing examples on flux? I think we are. I don't think I have anything else every right to say. Although, actually, no, a couple of things. One, I've spoken about default orientations, but I haven't written it down, so let me write that. Um, uh, where's purple? There's purple. Uh, orientation of a surface is often given if it is not default orientation is colon upward for open surfaces outward for closed surfaces e.g. plane paraboloid G sphere. Okay. Now there is another formula that you can use for flux that doesn't have that dot n in it. Um, I will not be demonstrating it, but you will find it in your textbook. I'll give it to you. Uh, you will see it occasionally. In fact, I think you'll even see it occasionally in some notes that I've typed up. But I've stopped using it because it's, uh, it's got baggage. It, it has hidden constraints, whereas that f dot n always works. And, when, and, and you know what it means. You, you know what you're doing. I mean, just from those little pictures that I drew with the little elements and the arrows going through them, you know what f dot n means. Whereas this e equation I'm about to give you now is just a random handful of symbols that have been thrown on the page. You don't quite know what they mean. Um, but I'll give it to you for the completion of your notes. In the special case, see it's already a special case, in the special case where S can be described by Z equals G of X, Y. In other words, you can make Z the subject. No, of course, we frequently can make Z the subject. So I'm saying special case. It's not really that special. 
um, but still there in the special case where you can make z the subject then the flux surface integral can be rearranged basically to give uh, so here's our classic flux equation but we can rearrange it notice I'm writing an R there not an S okay so this is already the projected surface integral actually I'm not going to use R I'm going to use D same thing but I'm wanting to use the letter R differently minus P dg dx let me just write it all out dg dy plus r dA remember that pq and r are your component functions of your velocity field your big F uh, g of course is your function of your surface once you've made z the subject d over here is the um, projected region which we have been using r for but I just quickly made a change because I'm using r as one of the component functions Okay, now you can use that formula. You are welcome to use that formula. Um, I'm not going to be uh, this last formula has built in upward orientation. So if you're wanting your surface to in fact have downward orientation, you'd have to slap a big minus in front of it. Okay. Right, enough boring talky talky. I want to do some examples. Um, any questions? Okay. All right, so flux questions can be quite tricky because there's a lot going on. There's a lot of sort of synthesis of things that up until now have been little skills and we're bringing them all together. Okay, let me do an example. Number 33. Yes. Um, you mean why is that a special case? Yeah. Sometimes you can't make Z the subject. Uh, if you can't make Z the subject, the previous formula doesn't mind. You can still do everything. You n at no point you need to make it the subject. Um, <coughs> so you'll need to make something the subject in order to finally turn your DS into a DA and do your projection, but it doesn't have to be Z. Whereas this formula has sort of a built-in that it's all in terms of X and Y and you've made Z the subject. Okay, number 33. Suppose that a certain fluid has velocity field. Okay, so here's the F. 0, Z, 3. Find the flux of this, file, of this fluid through the portion of the plane Z equals 6 minus 3X minus 2Y, which lies in the first octant. So, first thing I'm going to do is draw S. Uh, let's have a look. Z is going to... That's a 6. And that... Oh, hold on. This is one that we did before. It is, in fact. It's 21V. Um, this is a 3, and that is a, no, no, that's a 3, and that's a 2. There we go. Um, notice that there's no orientation given. Um, what would given orientation look like? Um, like question 35, it says find the flux of such and such upward. So you're wanting upward orientation. Um, 36B, so 36A, you'll see upward. 36B, you'll see outward. Both of those are the default orientations anyway, though. But they are given. 37, it says outward. And we'll hit flux again later on when we go to chapter 3. And the orientation is frequently given if it's not given upward and outward. Um, okay, I'm going to project onto here, so that's S, this is R, there's Y, there's X, that's Z, that's X, that's Y. Okay, I'm wanting flux. So without doing any thinking, I can write that and it's class test two, and the person has said, put down your pens, I can write that, and I know I've got one mark. People say you shouldn't teach to the test. But we all live in reality here. 
Um, okay, lovely. So um, I can project onto my R, lovely. F, I know what F is, 0, Z, 3. Ooh, I can already see a problem. There's a Z in there, but I'm projecting onto X, Y. Okay, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. N, what's N? Well, the N is the normal of my plane. It's a plane, so working out it's normal is very easy. I can just read it off the equation. What if that wasn't a plane? What if it was a paraboloid or a sphere? How would I get it's normal? Um, we'll talk about that. So what is this normal? It would be 3, 2, 1. Big major important thing here. Z component is positive. This implies upward orientation. What if the question had specifically said downward orientation? I would have taken that whole normal, but I would have put a minus in front of it. I would have made sure that my Z component was negative. It's the sign of your Z component that tells you whether your arrow is pointing vaguely upwards or whether it's pointing vaguely downwards. It doesn't have to be done straight up or straight down, but imagine taking that normal and putting the, the, the base of the arrow on the XY plane. Anywhere on the XY plane. Is your arrow sticking up above it or is it sticking below it? Above it means upward orientation. Below means downward orientation. And it's a sign of your Z component that tells you that. Okay. So what's my normal? My normal is 3, 2, 1. I now want a conversion factor. Um, question. I read it off my plane equation. 3x plus 2y plus z equals 6. Excellent. Um, 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 conversion factor. I want my x derivative, which is minus 3. I want my z, my y derivative, rather, which is minus 2. My conversion factor is 1 plus 9 plus 4. D, A. Okay. Um, that's, uh, you know, that's root 14, which I can take straight out. Let me do a little dot product here. Oh, I left my dot out. Sloppy. Um, that's 2z plus 3, and we got dA. Okie dokie. Now I can break my dA up into dy, dx. I can put in some limits. There's that z, though. I don't want z. My integral needs to be just x and y. So I'm going to replace z with 6 minus 3x minus 2y. Then I've got dy, and I've got dx, and y goes from 0 to... Mm, 3 minus 3 over 2x. For values of x, I go from 0 to 2, and now I integrate. Once again, all of the main parts of this problem are all centered in what I've written so far. Maximum of two marks from here on out. Everything else is here. Question. Where does the plus 3 go? The plus 3 goes here where I forgot to put it. Thank you. <laughs> Let me neaten that up for the posterity of the notes. And only people who listen to the audio will know that I left that out. There we go. Okay. And then you multiply that out and you solve it. And we have three minutes to go in the lecture. Do you really want to see me solve a polynomial integral? No, I don't think so. No. I will give you the answer. You probably want to leave a few lines because there's a fair amount going on there. And the answer is, what was that, 33? Oops. 33, 21. Nice round number. Well, round in the sense of doesn't have fractions. That's what I meant there. Um, I'm sure there was something I wanted to say. What I want to say? Oh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about marks. Because what are you going to get here? You're going to get you're going to get a mark for a drawing. You're going to get a mark for knowing the flux equation. You're going to get a no mark for the conversion factor. You're going to get a mark for your normal. You're going to get marks for your limits of integration, and you're probably going to get a mark for replacing z. That's a bunch of marks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's already seven marks. So this would probably be an eight or nine mark question with the remaining one or two marks for the stuff that happens where I wrote dot, dot, dot. Often what we'll do is we'll mark up to here, and then after that we'll just look at the end. Is it the right answer? Yes, it is. Is it not? No. Oh, we don't go through it. 
because that's, that's first year integration. That's first year integration. You've already passed first year integration. Um, that's not what we're trying to test you on. Um, okay, that's flux. Now, according to my own system, I'm going to demonstrate 34, and then you're going to give 35 a go. But you know what? 35 is a lot harder than both 33 and 34, so it's not really fair. So tomorrow what I'll do is I'll demonstrate, in fact, you know what, I'll see if I can find a really nasty one and I'll demonstrate that for you. And then you can have a go. All right, and then we're done with surface integrals until we hit Stokes theorem and divergence theorem.